Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Matthias Vermeulen, and I'm a research fellow at the Center for Law, Science, and Technology Studies at the Free University of Brussels, and I'm also a research fellow at the European University, European University Institute in uh, Florence in uh, Italy. And it's my pleasure to be uh, the chair of this, uh, what I think will be a very interesting panel called uh, Living Apart Together, the uh, Propertization of Personal Data, the Right to Privacy and uh, the Protection of Personal Data. This is, uh, contrary to the, the previous panel, this is an, um, a panel sponsored by uh, AMSOC, the AMSOC project, uh, which uh, Jo Pipson has already introduced to you. But basically what we are really interested in looking at in uh, this project is to see how um, users of social media are being empowered or uh, disempowered. And we're looking at this from an... Uh, a perspective of inclusion, literacy, and privacy. And, and this panel very much fits within the latter category, the, the privacy aspect, and then to be more precise, the uh, legal aspects of it. Because what we are really interested in is, to, is in seeing how innovative legal concepts can be used to empower uh, social media users. And now we have heard in the, in the previous panel a bit about the ongoing reforms of the uh, European data protection laws, and we have spoken briefly about concepts such as the, the right to be forgotten. And this all shows that the uh, uh, European legislator is actually looking at ways on how to improve the position of social media users and to improve their right to privacy. But apart from that discussion, we have also seen uh, a revival of an old debate on the introduction of uh, property rights uh, into personal, uh, personal data. And then in this context, data protection is not necessarily really seen as, uh, as a right, but some, as, a, as a commodity. Per your personal data are seen as something which you can um, transfer or sell uh, for, for some profit or in, in exchange for a specific uh, service. Now, um, this idea has really been going on since uh, a couple of decades, but it has really been revived, especially because there are now a couple of startups who are really pushing this idea, for instance, to uh, introduce the concept of data lockers, which you could actually, um, in which you can store your own personal data and sell it to people, to companies or authorities who are actually interested in it. Now, the question that we really want to explore in this panel is whether, um, or more precisely, how could vesting a property right in uh, personal data empower the users of social media? And how actually can such a right relate to the conventional protections which are now being um, uh, provided by a more traditional human rights law framework? So the question is, are, are both these type of rights uneasy bedfellows or can they happily live um, apart together? And we will also discuss a bit whether this idea is more uh, viable in the United States than compared to the European Union, for instance. Now, without further ado, I would uh, like to introduce the, the first speaker of today, which is uh, Professor James B. Rule, who is a part of the Center for, uh, for the Study of Law and Society at the University of uh, Berkeley in, uh, in California and uh, he's a long-time writer and uh, researcher on issue of privacy, uh, new technologies, and the protection of personal data. So, um, James, you have the floor. Can I have some water? Can, can we dispense with this? So there's no PowerPoint. I figured it would be better to break that to you directly rather than uh, sort of letting it come out gradually. Uh, and this is, I confess, partly a measure of personal um, backwardness, but there's a theory behind it, uh, a very old theory in the study of technology, and that is uh, an argument about uh, as to whether technology is uh, simply something that implements uh, interests or desires that people already have, or whether it actually shapes those desires and creates new needs that people didn't have before. 
Um, I recently wrote to a colleague at another university about a paper of his I'd seen cited and asked if I could have the text. And he said, well, really, the text isn't written yet, but uh, I, do, I could send you the PowerPoint uh, titles on which the text is going to be based when the text is ultimately written. Uh, it seemed to me that this is some kind of inversion of purpose or creation of some sort of new purpose that didn't exist before the technology existed. And uh, in the case of what I have to say uh, right now, I'd just like to ask you, instead of worrying about uh, you know, what new title is going to flash on next, that you kind of think instead of about the discrete uh, titles, which you can't see, uh, about the inter, let, let's say the uh, intellectual connective tissue among these titles, uh, that is why one part of the talk belongs or fails to belong, if necessary, to the rest of the talk and where it's all going. Uh, well, thank you for uh, making it possible for me to be here. Um, uh, I have a heavy responsibility. Uh, I've been asked to talk a bit about the, the, the possibilities of, uh, of a property right and personal information, uh, a subject which I've thought about a lot for years, uh, but I've been told in the most emphatic possible terms, uh, no more than 15 minutes, uh, preferably 10. <clears throat> so I'm adopting uh, a unique strategy, I think. Uh, I'm going to give a talk which consists only of conclusions. Uh, many of them, all of them, I hope, at least some degree controversial, without rationales, without justifications, uh, and I await uh, my uh, accountability at the end uh, when uh, asked to say, you know, why do you believe that, figuring that it's more interesting to say what it is that I believe rather than uh, go into these self-protective uh, gestures of uh, defending myself before I'm actually attacked. Uh, I re what I have to say is largely couched on uh, the situation in the United States where, uh, as you know, Americans go to extremes and never more than in matters of the tr uh, treatment of personal data. So that uh, the, the dissemination on a commercial basis of personal uh, facts and myths is uh, much more developed than it is elsewhere. And I'll spin out my belief as to why a certain kind of very carefully crafted uh, property right over personal information might actually be a very good thing in this country, in, in the United States. And uh, we can uh, speculate and consider uh, to what extent such ideas might be extended to Europe or to other parts of the world. First of all, some context. Think of what we're doing uh, in a kind of large historical sweep. Fifty years ago, uh, these institutional uh, uses and uh, systems for the treatment of personal data uh, were just getting to be politicized. The personal privacy was not, uh, as, it, it, even in this loose sense that we use, it was not a public issue in the same sense uh, as it is now. Uh, so we're, we're looking at uh, events and, and trends and processes that have, that have about that uh, about that degree of, uh, of uh, longevity since roughly the 1960s. Uh, and we're also thinking about privacy codes, those bodies of uh, the law and policy that have grown up in virtually all liberal democracies uh, in a little bit less than 50 years, 40, uh, 40 45 maybe at most. Uh, these, these privacy codes that we all are familiar with uh, have become very well elaborated. They're constantly in, in the process of evolution, as we we're hearing this morning, new wrinkles and uh, changes being discussed all the time. Uh, and I think it doesn't hurt to ask oneself, um, are we, is life more private than it was 50 years ago? You know, do, do we, on balance, have more say about uh, what's known about our personal lives and the boundaries between private and public life? and the, uh, uh, the treatment, uh, the use of personal information about ourselves by large organization, organizations. Or is it true, as some skeptical people say, that we now have lots more uh, privacy codes, but still less privacy than we did before? Uh, 
certainly in this country, uh, certainly in my country, uh, the United States already uh, is, uh, uh, has seen the commodification of personal information. There are enormous industries that have, uh, uh, that have grown up. And so one uh, devoted exclusively to the, to the creation, the compilation, and the packaging and selling of personal data. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, this is all in the context of asking, couldn't we do better? Are there other instruments, are there other, uh, are there other uh, policy directions or laws that might serve better to uh, retain some kind of meaningful control by ordinary so-called private individuals? in their data. In the United States, uh, these industries are, uh, include both ones that uh, all of you, I'm sure, know about, uh, the, the vast commercial, the uh, vast uh, industries devoted to consumer credit reporting, uh, uh, in importing of information among insurance companies, uh, information, uh, information systems devoted to advertising, marketing, uh, and other uh, forms of commercialization of personal data that probably would be news to you and some of which would be news to me. I'm com continually coming across uh, new kinds of, uh, new forms of uh, industries, new industry, qualitatively new industries that I don't, didn't know about. I always tell myself that I've heard everything in terms of the reconversion of personal information and I'm always uh, having to admit that I, I haven't heard it all. Uh, it's recently come to light uh, there are companies that specialize in the, the compilation and marketing of data on Americans as consumers, uh, not, uh, not exactly credit information and not exactly advertising information, information on how much as a retailer or as a seller of one service or another, you might want to do business with one kind of customer or another. Is this person affluent? What records of purchases uh, and uh, consumption habits do we have about them? What, uh, what sorts of financial resources do they have? And these, this, this industry, which was news to me, uh, actually uh, is not covered by the C uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act or its uh, FACTA, the successor of it. Uh, and once, uh, of course, it's perfectly legal, once in the United States personal information is loose, so to speak, once it's on the public record, uh, there's not much you can normally do about it to, to get it back or to stop its uh, circulation. Uh, among the biggest uh, consumers of these data, of these, uh, of these industries, the biggest customers of these uh, private reporting industries are government agencies who, for their own reasons, want to know about uh, uh, the consumption habits, the uh, financial resources, the, uh, the web browsing proclivities of private citizens, and these include the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, I presume the IRS, the people who collect taxes, and on and on. So the, the boundaries between private compilation and reporting of personal data and the public consumption of it by government uh, are growing um, uh, more and more blurry all the time. Consent is a formality in many of these uh, junctures, you, but in fact, uh, consent doesn't really become, it's not very m meaningful in these contexts if you have to give your consent in order to uh, live a normal life. If you want credit, you have to give consent. If you want uh, to the exploration of uh, all relevant data as, as it's construed by the people on that side, if you want health care, you've got to give consent to that. Um, it's, uh, it uh, makes you very skeptical about the meaning of consent. I recently booked my own travel to be with you here. I'm very glad for the chance. I gave consent to things I don't even know about in order to click through the various websites necessary simply to book the trip. So if the federal marshals come before the end of my talk and take me away, it's because I violated some consent that I gave that I didn't have time to read about because I had to get on with the rest of my life. I argue, and I'll, I'll just give the conclusions and you can ask me for the rationales later, I argue it would be a very good thing to have a, a, a right over the commercial exploitation of personal information about oneself. I'll explain more about what I mean. Uh, but uh, uh, some enduring say over the, the sale and trade of personal information about oneself uh, for commercial purposes only. I'm not talking about other kinds of legitimate public uses. 
Uh, and uh, again, I think that need is stronger in the United States uh, than it is elsewhere. In this, if this, if this right, as I imagine it, were in existence, opt-in would be the default condition. In other words, there would be no sale possible, legally possible, of commercial, uh, for commercial purposes of information about anybody uh, without the uh, assent of the person whose, whose data are being sold. Uh, this very fact would uh, reduce uh, vastly the amount of, uh, of uh, commercial compiling, uh, uh, analyzing, and reselling of personal data that's, uh, uh, that is uh, everyday reality in uh, American life today. Uh, that in itself would be an enormous, uh, of enormous value to most Americans, I think, most of the time even those many forms of exploitation of data on oneself that now go ahead uh, without, let alone without the consent, without the knowledge of Americans, would be, uh, would be illegal. Uh, for some Americans, probably including me and lots of other reasonable folks like myself, uh, they might be willing uh, to permit uh, some kinds of resale of, of their personal information, but they don't want to be in the situation where we are now, where once it's gone, it's lost. Uh, the possibilities of, uh, the, not the possibility, the realities of that loss are an everyday fact of life in, in my country. As more municipal records on people's use of things like uh, uh, they're paying their taxes, their utility bills, uh, public, uh, uh, public records on things like births, deaths, and marriages, uh, legal records on lawsuits, divorces, uh, uh, disputes of all kinds that end up in civil court. As more and more of these things are computerized, uh, it's more and more attractive and it's more and more the reality that, that these data are harvested, uh, they're compiled like, uh, I don't know, uh, soybean futures or something like that, and they're sold to people who might be interested in them for any number of, uh, of purposes, including investigative purposes by government agencies. So <laughs> uh, I certainly would like to have something to say uh, about uh, those industries that are making money off my uh, privacy or my non-privacy. Uh, and I believe there are many of us who would, who are, would not be categorically opposed to uh, commercial use of their data, but want some discriminating say about what downstream uses uh, occur. And that, that sort of possibility would be greatly uh, reinforced. It would, be, it would be brought into existence, I would say, if there were something like a commercial uh, privacy right over the exploitation of personal data, then one would have, if, if one wanted to push it that far, the right to demand royalties in the, on the resale of, of one's data, uh, much as you would do if you're, uh, much as you can do today, by the way, if you're a celebrity, so you can, you can charge people to use your name, but not as an ordinary private citizen. Uh, and more importantly, you could make or have somebody make for you discriminating contracts about how such data uh, might be used. Yes, it could be sold, but only to nonprofit organizations. Uh, yes, it can be sold, but not to companies that engage in uh, aggressive direct marketing that will call me at home and, or uh, send me obnoxious communications of one kind or another. Uh, yes, to ecologically responsible companies as certified by whoever's in charge of that uh, distinction, but no, not to polluting, uh, obnoxious, uh, uh, environmentally uh, disastrous companies. There's no technological reason why a system like this is not possible. The reasons why we don't already have this kind of discrimination in the use of our data are political, legal, and social, not technological. The kinds of discrimination that would be necessary to make a system like the one I'm imagining, it's pure imagination, uh, to make such a system work are child's play compared to the feats of genius that have been evolved to make a system like Facebook work. Uh, the problem is not technology, and we should stop ourselves and those we love from saying that technology is screwing our privacy uh, because these things could easily work differently in a different kind of world. Would property, right, uh, property rights of this kind substitute for or compete with 
approaches based on uh, more familiar principles, human rights, fair information practices, the, the sorts of thinking that goes, that underlies uh, current uh, uh, data protection agency practices that we're all familiar with. No. Why, why should it? It would simply take its place, a right of this kind, in an array of different protections that are available uh, to individuals. Uh, of course, there's no substitute for basic rights and basic fair information practices in the, uh, in the retention and use of uh, systems of personal data. Of course, the people who keep personal data for any purpose ought to be responsible for the, uh, for the safekeeping of the data, for the accuracy of data. The, the data should be, uh, under all circumstances, should be uh, subject to uh, challenge for accuracy and uh, according uh, to, to proper use. Uh, all of that uh, should go without saying. Uh, what a property right could do, uh, and I think would do, uh, is actually very uh, is dis distinctively different and complementary. One, it would afford more discriminating control as to what commercial possibilities are open and what are not to uh, would-be users. And two, and this is extremely important, again, purely in my imagination, but imagination, I think, is important in these matters. It would create a kind of grassroots constituency of, of interest and involvement in the fate of personal data that does not now exist. Let's face it, one big shortcoming of existing privacy codes and the, and the whole tradition that they're uh, involved in is they have failed, I, I assert, so you can roast me about this in the questions if you like. They have failed to create considerable grassroots support and attention to an understanding of protections that are available to people. They are regarded, uh, to use a term that may be out of fashion, uh, may never be known in Europe anyway, privacy wonks. What are privacy wonks? Wonk is a, a slang word that used to be used for people, obsessive intellectually obsessive people who want to know everything about some subject. Uh, it happens to be the word no spelled backwards, a wonk. We are all privacy wonks. We know about these policy debates. They're not common currency among the great public. If there were a right of this kind uh, which, uh, in which people actually affected the downstream uses of their data by um, uh, giving their yay or nay to various different possible uses, and in which there were, uh, in, an in a limiting case, the right of collecting royalties for certain uses, people would start to care. And in that case, uh, there might be more public awareness and understanding that all kinds of things are happening with our data that we don't know about, uh, but which if we knew about them, uh, we might not like. Uh, and which, if we could get their hands on them, might, we might want to turn to our advantage rather than to our disadvantage. So why would we like, uh, so uh, a, right, a right of this kind would, be, would have to be very carefully crafted. It should never be susceptible to use in order to stop public discourse. Mr. Deus K should never be able to invoke his commercial privacy rights to stop uh, uh, public uh, d d discussion about his uh, way of life uh, as it affects his role as a public servant. Uh, the, it, the rights of this, of this kind should certainly be subject to, uh, 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 should, should be of short duration. People should not uh, be permitted to make sales of their rights that would, uh, uh, that would uh, resemble the sales of rights uh, in Soviet enterprises to their former workers who who sold them in turn to speculators who now are known as oligarchs. There should be rights renewable for six months or a year. Uh, and they should be, uh, they should be, uh, it should be a right uh, that uh, should, not, uh, should not be waivable in any personal sense. It should not certainly be exchangeable for ordinary services such, such that you have to give up your rights in order to be uh, on Facebook or to book your airplane or something like that. Uh, but carefully crafted, Sensitively targeted, a uh, right like this could add an enormous amount to protections that, uh, uh, that we see more and more needed in a world where personal data is worth more and more money all the time.
Well, thanks a lot, James, for this uh, quite provocative uh, talk and very interesting talk, which will be subject to quite some debate, I would, uh, I would hope. Uh, we'll immediately move to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Nadja Purtova. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, European and Economic Law Department of the University of uh, Groningen. And she obtained her PhD at the Tilt Institute in Tilburg on exactly this topic. It's, her thesis was called Property Rights in Personal Data, a European Perspective. So I, I couldn't think of anybody more suitable to talk about uh, this particular topic. Nadja, you have the floor. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would first of all like to say thank you for the honor of being invited to speak here among my esteemed, esteemed colleagues. And I was asked, well, I, today I will talk about the European aspect, uh, European approach to the argument in favor of propertization of personal information, and I will also try to put it in the context of social networks. Uh, European argument on propertization of personal data has been influenced heavily by the argument in the United States. Indeed, uh, the first ideas to introduce property rights and personal data on the other side of the Atlantic have appeared as early as uh, the 60s, I believe, and um, the first article that I could find in Europe on this subject was dated back to 2003. Um, there are several aspects where the, Europe, uh, where the Europeans adopted some parts of the, of the American argument, and this is uh, basically the same arguments for and against propertizations have been brought in the United uh, brought forward in the United States and in Europe. Uh, a very significant proportion of the argument is focused on the meaning of property. What do we mean when we propose, what scope of rights we mean when we propose to introduce property rights in personal data. Uh, however, as much as the Europeans borrowed from the, uh, from the US scholars on this matter, the European debate is quite unique indeed. What distinguishes it from its uh, American counterpart is that in the United States, uh, partially the uh, proponents of propertization offered it because there is nothing else, at least in private sector, to protect indiv individuals from abuses of personal data. Whereas in Europe, we have a distinct right to personal data protection. This is one of the biggest and uh, most significant differences between the American and European debates. Um, another difference is that this right doesn't, uh, exists um, on the level of national constitutions, European directives, national implementing acts, but also on the level of the uh, human rights treaties, European Convention on Human Rights, and it, pre uh, it, it prevents uh, the de debate in Europe on property and personal data to develop in vacuum. For instance, a significant part of the American debate focuses on the default rules of propertization. So on what conditions should we be allowed to exchange our personal information and whether these conditions should be able, uh, whether we should be able to contract around those conditions. Whereas in Europe, this is set in law on the level of European Convention of Human Rights that certain aspects of data protection cannot be waived. So you can sell your personal data, but you can never waive a full control over your personal data. So um, I will move further. Because we have, um, uh, because Europeans do have a particular right to respect, uh, to protection of personal data, the question, let's say, how the propertization argument came about in Europe is not because we don't have anything else and we were looking for a back door to introduce the data protection into our system. The key question is, can property deliver more than the current system of data protection? Uh, indeed, the current, uh, the current data protection directive was, uh, uh, was discussed in the 80s and was finally adopted in 95. And back then, the data, the, the flow of personal data and data protect, pr processing practices were very different from what is going on now. The only very limited amount and kinds of actors were involved 
in this chain of processing, usually just several. And it was quite difficult, uh, diff um, quite simple to see how the piece of data made it from point A to point B. And these uh, few actors also had quite distinctive roles Controller and processor. Controller de determined the goals and means of processing, and processor processed personal data on behalf of the controller. However, uh, in 2000, uh, approximately, very roughly speaking, technological developments took another turn, and uh, such phenomena as data sharing, mobile technology, cloud computing, internet, social networks, made, uh, well, contributed were part of a proliferation of uh, processing of personal data. And the flow of personal information now looks very different. I very much like this uh, drawing by Escher. Basically, when you look at it, it's not quite clear how these people, let's say, move around uh, this space. So is in the current uh, data, uh, personal data flow. It is not clear even, uh, for instance, when um, large uh, IT consultancies perform research into data security breaches. Even for forensic experts, it is not clear how a particular piece of data made it from point A from, to point B. It is because of that, because of the developments in cloud computing, there are so many actors of so many kinds involved into processing of personal data. So there are many scapegoats to blame if something goes wrong. And that also makes the implementation or well, compliance and enforcement of the rules of the directive very different, uh, very difficult. It is difficult for a data subject to identify the door to knock at when uh, he's looking for a remedy. What property can offer? Uh, to answer this question, we should first focus on the meaning of property. And there is no, uh, there is no uniform understanding of it, let's say, in Europe. First of all, well, this is one of the lessons we, I learned from the American debate, from the re, uh, overview of the literature in the US. Uh, debate on the meaning of property is very much like this fairy tale about six blind people who heard that there is an elephant in the village and they went to see the elephant well what that is and one of them grabbed on the tail the other on the ear and the one who grabbed on the tail said that the elephant was a was a rope because that's what he felt and the one who was holding on to the ear said the elephant is this uh, is a sail and n uh, nobody out of those six blind people actually knew that the elephant is the elephant. And the pro pro property debate is very much the same. Um, scholars from the area of economic analysis of law perceive property uh, in one way as a um, right to consume the good. Lawyers define it in a different way. Sociologists talk of property as a rhetorical tool to express the connection of an object to self and the value of this object. Basically, um, to clear the debate, I'm uh, specifying that my argument has to do with the legal approach to property. Of course, it is fed by social and economic perspective, but still. Um, there are two important uh, aspects that define a legal, a legal notion of property. Erga omnes effect, and I will explain what that is, and fragmentation or divisibility of property rights. Erga omnes effect is a Latin term for the effect that property cl claims have against the rest of the world. Um, very much, uh, uh, once personal data is treated as property, uh, it will not be necess no, it, it will no longer be necessary to figure out whether the actor at fault or the actor involved in the processing was the controller. Sorry, was the controller? <laughs> More fun is coming. Well, was, was the uh, whether this actor is a controller or a professor? Or pro processor. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> little tired. Um, uh, at the moment, under the directive, all data protection obligations lie, in fact, on the controller. 
whereas under the prioritization regime, it doesn't really matter. As in case of consumer protection law in many jurisdictions, for instance, if you buy a defect product, you can uh, turn your claim either to the shop or to the producer, and the same would basically apply to the data protection. Uh, now to the fun example, imagine you posted your picture on Facebook or on your other social, uh, social network. And um, some months later, you walk along the street and you see a poster using your picture in the commercial of a dating agency, for instance. So uh, to tackle this, obviously there was no consent asked. And, uh, well, where do you go to? to claim your data protection right. You can either, um, let's say, turn your claim against the advertising, advertising agency that placed this commercial, or against the Facebook, because that's where it was uploaded from, or the dating agency who ordered this commercial, and this is very roughly speaking. Um, second element, divisibility. Divisibility means that, and this concept is quite uh, it is familiar to those of us who come from common law jurisdictions and less familiar to uh, representatives of um, continental law, um, is a characteristic that makes property not a single monolith right that comprises right to destroy, uh, use the fruits and um, enjoy uh, a certain good. In fact, According to this concept of divisibility, property consists of, well, it is described as a bundle of sticks, and it consists, it can be divided into many sticks and each, sorry, in, into many bunches, and each bunch will enjoy this ergo omnis protection. And, implication, and the implication that it has for data protection is that when one uh, discloses his personal information, posts something on the social network, it does not necessarily mean that hereby he waives control over his personal data. Uh, in fact, the system would remind of a cake and a slice. Uh, in order to treat somebody for a cake, you don't have to give them the whole cake. And the holder of a small piece cannot give to the other, to the third party, more than he actually has. And this is also a characteristic of property law. For instance, Facebook having a right to process your personal information for the purposes of providing communication between you and your friends cannot let your personal information to advertisement agencies. Uh, now I'll try to put <coughs> this story more in the context of social media. Uh, just a few Obviously, the prioritization of personal data would change the entire approach to, personal, uh, to, to data protection, and uh, each of those implications is valid for the context of uh, social networks. I will just name a few uh, very uh, significant implications. First of all, introduction of property in personal data would make a clear statement on the distribution of entitlements in your personal data. Uh, Propertization means that by default, the ownership, the right to exclude everybody else from your personal data belongs to the individual, uh, which precludes somebody like Facebook in their privacy statements from claiming the, uh, how was it, a couple of years ago, um, universal and perpetual license in everything you upload up there. Uh, Propertization would guarantee no processing by default unless law or consent allow otherwise. And that would result in more transparency and better, better accountability of the data processing actors, including social network sites. Um, on top of that, if one adopts this licensing approach to data processing, when these licenses are formed not by the corporations, information industries themselves, but by the external actors, by the state, for instance, this would um, prevent uh, such uh, large and powerful actors from framing the rules of the game as empirical research into uh, the privacy preferences or behavior of that subject shows. The default rules that have been established at the beginning of the game tend to stick. Individuals do not switch 
often from the default rules. So prioritization will make sure that the default rules are privacy friendly. Um, and on top of that, licenses can also try and capture the contexts in which individuals want to disclose their data, whether it is to friends or to commercial users, for instance. Now, I was asked the question, why do we have to introduce property, uh, property rights and personal data? Maybe the same goals can be achieved by other means. So it's a little bit of a fork and a knife versus Chinese sticks question. Uh, and it is, well, to answer this, I'd start with what is exactly the goal that you want to achieve. And my argument departed, derived from the normative, from the policy goal of achieving informational self-determination. Informational self-determination is the right of an individual to control disclosure and use of his personal data. And um, erga omnis effect, or effect against the entire world, actually uh, secures this. And um, recent, actually, um, yeah, I jumped through one slide. Uh, the recent proposal for the data protection reform was um, um, commission actually explains the reform proposal in, life, in, in light of the uh, idea of propertization. Nelly Cruz, the vice president of European Commission, recently said that the proposal starts from the presumption that everybody owns his personal data. But in fact, I doubt that it is really so. Well, it is true that there are some elements that point at the intent to introduce this effect against the rest of the world. For instance, um, they fixed this failure of the, data, of the directive, and uh, now the remedies for data protection violations are available against controller or processor, and they are jointly uh, liable. Also, they introduced the principle of accountability where the controller does not only have to comply with the data protection regulation, but also has to maintain the documentation and evidence of compliance, for instance, the burden of proof that there is a consent for processing lies on the controller. There is uh, a right to be forgotten, which means basically that once uh, that the individual can demand that his data will be deleted under certain conditions. Um, then there is a new right to data portability, uh, a right that empowers one uh, data subject to take his personal data for instance, from a, a social network site in a machine-readable format and uh, transfer it to another platform. However, the, uh, the regulation is um, coming seriously short of introducing the property right in personal data uh, for a reason that it does not enforce the informational self-determination the default entitlement under the regulation, or it seems to me, and of course the regulation is only in draft and maybe it will be adjusted, but it seems to me that the default entitlement in processing of personal data is not assigned with the individual but with the corporation. And this is achieved by tightening the requirements for consent to the extent that it becomes an exception rather than a rule for data processing. And broadening the scope of use of such vaguely defined uh, grounds of processing as legitimate, for instance, business interest. Uh, so <coughs> this brings me back to the American uh, debate on propertization. As in the US, the propertization argument was seen as the back door to introduce something that does not exist in the system. Uh, if the regulation will be adopted in the shape that it is now, I'm afraid the European propertization debate will assume a comparable function to argue in favor of the default entitlement in personal data with the individual rather than with the corporation. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Nadja. And uh, we're going immediately to the next speaker, who is uh, Orla Linsky. She is a lecturer in law at the London School of Economics, and she has just submitted her uh, PhD thesis at the University of Cambridge on uh, data protection. Um, Orla, you have the floor.
Okay, well then I will uh, do like Professor Rule and go without PowerPoint for the day. Um, so I have the slightly daunting task of following Nadia on this, uh, because as you've heard, Nadia has written a watertight thesis and book on the advocating for um, property rights and personal data um, to kind of enhance the EU system of uh, personal data regulation. I think the idea of introducing property rights and personal data is, it, it, it's quite an intuitive one. Uh, we've probably have seen over the past few days on Facebook how um, individuals have been posting a status update claiming a copyright over the data that they posted online um, under the Berne Convention. So you can see how for individuals somehow this seems like a, an instinctive reaction. It's my data, get your hands off. And I think there might be something there in so far as um, I'm not an IP lawyer, but the Berne Convention allows for um, copyright to be divided into to, to kind of two aspects, the economic aspect and also the kind of morality rights, which are kind of integrity rights over data. So even if you alienate the economic aspects, you can maintain um, the kind of uh, integrity right, which is somebody can't use this, this, this data for um, abusive purposes. You could question whether that kind of distinction could be incorporated um, into EU data protection law. Nevertheless, what I'm going to argue for today is against the idea of propertization of personal data. Mainly just to distinguish my presentation from Nadia's, but also because I'm not convinced that this is um, the correct response uh, to this issue in the EU. I think we come from a very different regulatory context to in the US. And so in many ways, I would see property rights as um, a US solution to what is a uniquely US problem, which is the issue that um, the regulation of the private sector is sector specific and therefore you have data that's falling in between the gaps um, as we've heard earlier and property rights is a kind of a nice way to, to tie this, this data in and, and to grant it protection. Whereas by contrast in the EU I believe we already have a solution in place. It's simply um, a matter of manipulating that solution which is our de general data protection framework um, in order to make it more effective. So this is really, in my opinion, a, a question of effectiveness rather than uh, kind of throwing the system we have out and, and introducing a whole new system. So what I would argue is really that the, the, the property rights solution is probably not a proportionate response um, to the problems that uh, we're facing, which is this, um, well, what are the problems? I would say there are probably three problems. The first and the main problem um, is the one that was touched on by Nadia, which is the ac ac accountability issue. Um, when your data is passed um, f you know, fr from one processor to another, how do you know against whom you can exercise your rights? How do you know where a violation has um, come about? How can you exercise the rights which are granted to you by EU data protection law? And I think that, that is a serious issue and propertization might help to, to rectify that because, as Nadia said, property rights are um, erga omnes, which means they can be enforceable against the world at large. A second um, problem which property rights might solve um, is to more or less reduce the regulatory costs of data protection. So I guess the argument here would be that if we introduce uh, a market mechanism, and um, therefore giving individuals um, full entitlement to do as they please with their data, including to alienate it completely, so to give it away and waive all rights over it, so a full market mechanism, um, then this data, or these rights will be allocated more efficiently. Those who really care about their privacy will not do this, and those who are less privacy conscious will, may, might be willing to do this in exchange for some sort of service or benefit in kind. The third problem that property rights might help to solve um, is the enforcement issue, simply because it, will, it might become more clear to data subjects or to individuals um, who it is that has their data and um, how they can exercise their rights against them. But I would say that there, there are certain limitations to the, introdu to the introduction of um, property rights. From a feasibility perspective, um, in the EU, we can't have this unlimited alienability or sale of rights. You can't get rid of all of the rights that you have um, over your personal data because um, 
the right to privacy will apply and fundamental rights cannot be waived in their entirety. So that is the first kind of key limitation. We could never have a full kind of free market system applicable to our personal data in the EU because we are constrained by the European Convention of um, Fundamental Rights, or of Human Rights, sorry, and then the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And this EU Charter, not only does it contain a right to privacy, it also contains an explicit right to data protection. But I'll come back to that a little later. The second question that you could say, or the second limit maybe on whether or not the EU could introduce a property rights approach, um, is based on competence. The EU only has the competence um, to regulate areas where the member states have explicitly given it this competence. Um, and you could question whether or not the EU then has the power to regulate the private law, as opposed to the public law, of member states. The way the EU has introduced data protection regulation um, is through a market integration um, kind of lens. So the EU, when it introduced the 1995 directive, rather than basing this entirely on fundamental rights, because the EU has no competence to enact fundamental rights legislation, it said that this legislation was necessary in order to ensure the free flow of data between member states. So uh, the idea was here that if you harmonize the laws in the various member states or bring them up to more or less a level playing field, that then there can be no objections to the free flow of data between these member states and this will facilitate the internal market. So interestingly enough here, you see that in the EU's initial rationale for data protection regulation, not only do you have the fundamental rights aspect, but you also have this implicit idea that data is a commodity um, which can be traded. So we have the idea accepted that data is a commodity that can be traded, but there are safeguards in place. And they're the safeguards that are in the 95 directive and that are currently being renegotiated. So I think it's arguable that the property rights solution could equally be introduced, well, could have been introduced through this market integration kind of rationale. And now um, the EU has an explicit legal basis to enact data protection regulations. So from a practical perspective, the EU could introduce property rights regulation um, of personal data. Um, it would be constrained by the European Convention of Human Rights. So we could never have a fully fledged market mechanism where you can sell your data and never claim a right over it again. But even if this is feasible, I think the question is, is it desirable? What um, added value does this have for you know, us as individuals or as users of social networks? And I think there are, there are a couple of kind of important limitations which come with the introduction of um, a property rights system. The first is that you are kind of straddling what is a new right to data protection with all of the baggage that comes with the right to property. Although at national level, the right to property is um, quite a strong one, constitutionally protected in many member states, it hasn't been very successful um, as a right, particularly before the EU courts. So um, you've had very few cases, save where a, um, a property is, uh, personal property is expropriated, where this right has been successfully invoked. So I don't know, is it a stronger right um, to invoke before courts than, for instance, the right to data protection, which kind of finds its foundations in the right to privacy. Particularly, I mean, there's one recent case where um, the European Court of Justice has found that um, the right, the freedom to conduct a business has trumped um, the right to intellectual property. So freedom to conduct a business, which I think most people thought was a right without teeth, has actually trumped the established right to property. Now, that, that was in quite exceptional circumstances, but I still think we have to question what benefits can we get from kind of introducing property discourse in this area. The second thing is that enforcement would um, remain an issue. Even if you know against whom you have these rights to invoke, um, is that going to make it any easier to, to invoke them? Uh, this would also lead to additional compliance costs. Um, so I, I suppose there'd be some sort of licensing system which is put in place. 
the type of licensing system that maybe we have for intellectual property rights like copyright at the moment, so some sort of digital rights management system. Um, the costs of that type of system are currently passed on to uh, the music industry. If we introduce that type of system for personal data, who would pay for it? Would it be us as users? Would it be the, the, the companies that are using um, this sort of system? That's not to say it's completely impossible. As we've heard, this is technologically feasible. It's a question of um, political will, of social will, of legal will. Um, but in, in the EU, I would argue that at the moment, uh, we have sufficient basis for individuals to negotiate their rights while maintaining a kind of a minimum soul of, um, of, of guarantees or safeguards over their personal data. So do we need to take it that step further? Um, the other problem I see with property rights is that even if we have property rights over our personal data, a certain amount of regulation remains necessary. So why do we need regulation if we have property rights? Surely we as individuals are um, perfectly capable of negotiating our own contracts or um, indicating our own preferences. Well, you always have um, market failures, like information asymmetry, where one side to the bargain knows more than the other side. And for that reason, um, you know, data protection regulation is there to kind of um, correct those market failures. So I would say that even if you introduce property rights, there will be some circumstances in which um, you would still need to, to, to regulate in order to correct these failures. So what then? I've been saying that I believe that the current system um, is adequate to kind of deal with um, the question of, um, well, in particular, this accountability issue. Who can you invoke your rights against? And that we don't need property rights because uh, there are other alternatives available and we don't need to go that far. But this kind of begs the question, what are those alternative um, avenues? Well, first of all, I think that already inherent in the system that we have is this idea of informational self-determination. And that could be drawn on more um, or relied on more in order to facilitate um, technological mechanisms which allow you to, um, in certain instances, trade your data but while retaining safeguards. So, as I said, in the EU Charter, you have a right to privacy already. Um, and there's also been an additional right to data protection. So, this kind of begs the question, why do we need both? What's the difference between the right to data protection and the right to privacy? Well, I think if you look at the case law of the European Court of Human Rights to kind of indicate um, what aspects of data protection are already um, in encompassed in the, in the court's case law, um, you could argue that the difference between data protection and privacy is that data protection also gives individuals control over their personal data. Uh, now, this isn't explicitly stated in the EU regulation. Um, the Commission maintains that's because it doesn't have the competence to, in, to kind of um, enact provisions relating to that, which I find implausible, um, to say the least. But I think you can see that many of the provisions in data protection regulation are um, motivated by this idea of individual control. Um, a classic example is the right to data, port uh, data portability in the new regulation. That's not a right that flows from privacy law as such. Um, it doesn't flow from the kind of market integration aim of data protection. So I would say the justification for the introduction of a right like that is to give individuals more control over their personal data. If I want to take all of my data back from Facebook in a, in a form that can be used on another social network, I will be able to to, to receive that data in a form that makes it technologically feasible. My data will be portable, I will have control over it. The question of control is a bit of a double-edged sword, insofar as if we accept that data protection pursues, in addition to the protection of privacy, um, the role of giving individuals control over their personal data, we could ask, um, if I'm completely in, my, in control over my personal data, why can't I then um, alienate all of my rights? Why can't I exercise um, this right to data protection in order to, to lose control? 
Uh, this is a question I haven't had the opportunity to think about quite a lot, but I think you can see parallels in other rights, like in the right to property, uh, the very exercise of the right um, allows you to alienate the right. But th So you could, you could maybe see that, that kind of a conflict. Um, a second alternative, and one that was mentioned to us by Matthias, is the idea, if at the moment the major problem is accountability, why not then tweak the definition of data processor or data controller um, in order to make sure that accountability is clear? Um, I, think, I think this is a good idea. However, I, I, I think I would exercise some caution about enlarging those, uh, enlarging those definitions too much um, just because you run the risk of having too many people fall within the scope and have responsibilities under data protection regulation and then um, the monitoring becomes, becomes an issue. Um, what I would say, uh, if I were to design the ideal way forward on this, I think that um, what is needed, we, we, we've had the carrot for long enough, I would take the hard line and say now we need the stick. Um, and to go along with a system like that that exists in, for, for example, competition law, where you have the rules set out in advance, so we maintain some regulation, some rules which are set out um, in a directive or in a regulation, which are clear to companies. And given that individuals themselves are finding it difficult to exercise all of the rights that are written in legislation. The first time I read the Data Protection Directive, um, I, I certainly had the feeling of being overwhelmed and of thinking, well, I have no idea who's processing my, my data and where I could access that and how I could delete this. And I think most individuals would feel similarly. So how can, how can, how can a regulatory authority or a data protection um, commission effectively exercise the rights? I think the, the idea is that um, you have some sort of a reporting system where if um, a company has breached the data protection rules, and this is reported to a data protection authority, the data protection authority is then in a position to impose serious fines if this is the case. So you have to, I would, I would say it's the fear factor. You have to make sure that companies are complying with data protection rules, um, not, not by simply wishing this to happen, but by putting in place um, strict sanctions if this is not the case. And I see that in, in an era when data has been processed more and more as possibly one of the only kind of viable um, ways forward. And this has worked quite well, as I said, in areas like competition law, where um, companies are more or less left to their own devices. If there's a breach, um, an authority will investigate, and if the breach is actually, um, if the breach is prosecuted, a company will be fined 10% of its annual turnover, and that for a company is an incentive to comply with the rules. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think I've deviated slightly from uh, the property rights discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orla, and uh, we'll immediately proceed with uh, a much-needed non-legal perspective in this panel. So um, I'm happy to introduce Mr. Søren Preibusch. Um, he has recently joined Microsoft Research as a postdoctoral fellow. I, I actually was informed that it's, it's his first presentation in this uh, new capacity. So uh, his research deals with the behavioral economics of uh, privacy and we are looking forward to, uh, to hear his perspective on, on this issue. Thank you very much, Matthias. Oh. Yes. So indeed, my, uh, my first presentation as a Microsoft employee, <laughs> and I hope uh, I'll live up to it. Um, I am, um, oh, well, um, I think um, my intention will be to provide a uh, perspective from a computer scientist, half economist, and to give you some empirical evidence. I'll describe some phenomena that we observe in the wild and some phenomena that I picture will happen. And I'll talk about markets and I'll talk about what would be better than markets. I'll very much describe those things. I won't say that data collection is bad per se. I, would say, I don't say data collection is is good per se, but I just want to outline some phenomena that we, I think we should keep in mind. And I'll start with something quite simple, that is uh, markets as we know them or have known them for several centuries, and that we deal with uh, products, we as consumers buy products, we consume services from a service provider, and we 
pay for those services with money at the price that is given by the supplier of these services. Now, as we have moved online, then um, not only do we pay with money, but we also provide personal data to the service provider, which in some cases is natural given that in the context of distance selling, if you want to actually receive the product, you have to indicate a shipping address. So we have to acknowledge that some exchange of personal data is always necessary. And then, of course, we provide some of this data which can be also used for other purposes, which I would do term like personalization and understand it as, as a broad sense. That is like a set of convenience features or also a way to offer personalized product recommendations. So there's actually some benefit flowing back to the consumer from the side of the service provider. Now, interestingly, um, we have a, a good understanding of the basic models. Obviously it, get, it obviously, it gets a bit more complicated when we acknowledge that there are many users and not a single user, and also these users exchange things amongst each other, and social networking sites have been a recurring theme throughout the day today. Um, but I'll keep it simple for the sake of engaging in a sensible discussion today. Now, um, as we think of markets where we buy products, say we buy a digital camera, or we buy a DVD, or we buy cinema tickets online, then um, in principle I could buy these products from any supplier that's out there, and we know there are many online shops, for instance, that sell me books, that sell me a DVD. So the question for a service provider is then, of course, not what to sell, but at which price to sell, and at which level of personal data. So these were the two parameters that a service provider has to set when designing its offerings. And here we enter quite quickly into the debate of competition on privacy, which I've been advocating for a long time. And indeed, when we look at this empirically, we actually see evidence that online shops differentiate on data collection. And this, I think, is a very interesting feature. Um, online shops, which sell the, similar, the same thing, they have different price, they have different prices, and they ask for different amounts of personal data. And this differentiation is, in fact, in accordance with what microeconomic theory would project. If we look at free services, which correspond to other popular web activities, such as web search, online social networking, or blogging, we don't see this differentiation. So if you want to consume a free service instead of buying something, wherever you turn to to consume the service, you will actually be asked a similar amount of questions that invade your privacy, <coughs> which means that whereas we have choice, that is provided by the market in terms of online retailing, we don't have this choice when it comes to free services. Um, competition is good, monopolies aren't that good, and I think even non-economists would agree on that. Um, it has been known for a while that, that monopolies charge higher prices. And when we look online, empirical evidence also tells us that monopolies ask for more prices. I use the term monopolies here not in a strict sense. By monopolies, I just save space on the slides to say sites for which there is no immediately obvious alternative, such as eBay, YouTube, and the like. So for these sites, we can, in fact, empirically show, and we have done this, that these sites collect significantly more personal data from users. And social networking sites, although they are not monopolies because we have so many of those still around, so you could, in, 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 in principle, turn to in other social network sites, they behave as if they were monopolies when we look at their data collection. So online social networking sites collect lots of personal information and add a wide range of details that cover all aspects of the user's personal lives, which may give us a hint as to which extent switching costs, in fact, or the, the lack of data portability have locked users in so that online social networking sites can collect large amounts of personal data. Um, but let's come back to the, to the more... Um, more positive view of online retailing where actually users have choice. So when users do have choice, how do users behave? How do users exercise this choice? Because when, as we do in regulation or as we design new um, mechanisms in the market, we actually want to address users' preferences. So the first step would be to understand what users actually want. If we don't know what users want, then we can't design regulation or enforcement mechanisms that would address their concerns. So this is why I'm studying in a series of experiments, which typically involve several hundreds or thousands of users, and what users want when it comes to online decisions that may impact their privacy. 
So we have run a, a number of studies where we sold products to participants in experimental settings. So we sold, uh, for instance, DVDs, we sold cinema tickets, and every time consumers, that is participants, had a choice between different retailers that differed on the amount of personal data they collect and the price at which you could buy this product. Now one very baseline, or one, one very um, strong result here is that privacy actually shapes consumers' consumption choices. It's not that privacy would not have an impact, and it's wrong to say that users do not care about privacy. Indeed, when better privacy comes for free, so when the two retailers charge the same price, but one is better on privacy, this retailer, which is better on privacy, will actually grab the lion's share of the market. And a better on privacy, I mean the retailer which collects less personal information, collects less sensitive personal information, or demands less usage rights than the alternative competing retailer. Now, it looks less positive when we then have to pay for privacy. So the concept of privacy at a premium actually occurs when you think of all these discounts which you can um, sign up for when you opt into the newsletter. So typically, when you want better privacy, you have to spend more and you have to pay a little premium. So then, in our experiments, for instance, we sold cinema tickets at one euro more when you did not want to reveal your mobile phone number or when you, did not, when you didn't want to subscribe to advertising emails. This one euro corresponds to something like 5 to 10% of the retailing price, so it's actually quite high when we compare it to something like loyalty cards where the percentage of a discount is actually sub 1%. So how many users would be willing to pay extra or pay a little amount extra for better privacy? I was surprised to see that the proportion of people who open their wallets for better privacy is actually quite large. So almost one third of consumers is willing to pay one euro extra to not reveal their mobile phone number. It is a privacy friendly <coughs> retailer which is more expensive will be preferred by almost one third of consumers. It's less so much when we um, talk about usage rights. So for instance we gave users the ability to opt into advertising emails and that get one euro of their retailing price then it was almost like just about one-tenth of consumers who are willing to opt into that. So we see that consumers are less likely to pay for more restrained usage rights than for restrained data collection. Obviously, we could argue that it's not about um, that, that, that users have developed strategies to cope with the constant influx of advertising emails and that technical solutions such as junk mail filters or throwaway email, email address have become a substitute for the privacy invasion here. But again, the baseline or like the, 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 the conclusion here that, that the take home message is that, um, that users are willing to pay for privacy, but there's still discounts are overriding privacy or genuine privacy preference. So when there is a monetary benefit for disclosing personal data, users will typically go for the discount and not act according to their generally expressed privacy preferences. We have heard something about markets earlier in the session, and, I would, and I've shown you also some of the market mechanisms where retailers or other online social networks, which I've also studied, or other services provide a, um, a service, and then through, through payments you could qualify for better privacy. I want to... Um, to offer two perspectives of on, on, on mechanisms that could go beyond market-based solutions. Because although the market is good, the market isn't perfect because of all the information asymmetries. And actually, we witness a broad range of market failures when it comes to privacy. The first mechanisms that would go beyond market-based solutions are privacy negotiations. So consumers and service providers individually agree on, what, on which terms should govern the exchange relation that happens with regards to products, money, and personal data. And this is then negotiated on an individual level, so a, tr a privacy policy is actually tailored for each individual transaction, which means that we now internalize the choice between different service alternatives. As I've shown you for the retailers, there were different retailers on the market that charged different prices and asked for different amounts of personal data. Now we internalize this choice for a given retailer. 
by internalizing, we have ob obviously several advantages. One is that we save on transaction costs. This is what's always interesting to economists. More pragmatically, we are also enable a new range of convenience features, such as the ability to preempt privacy settings that would satisfy users called smart defaults. And obviously, the retailer has the ability to incentivize additional data disclosure and then use the data which has been incentivized in such manner. A different way to go beyond markets would be actually to tap into the social exchange relationship. And I think there's a very, very powerful mechanism. I think it's something we'll see more in the future. Um, so far, it's all been very compulsory and very hierarchical. So the service provider says, here's my web form, fill it in. Here's my privacy policy, consent to it. Otherwise, you can't continue. Let's make it more social and engage actually in a dialogue between a service provider and a customer. And this social exchange will actually be beneficial for both parties. I want to show you how this could look like by keeping some of the aspects of current interaction mechanisms. Here you can see a form, which is the form we gave to uh, several thousand participants recently in an experiment we currently we have conducted and currently conducting um, again. This form is, is about yourself. It's a series of 10 questions plus two check questions. Actually, we gave people this form and say, everything is optional in this form. You can submit this form without filling in any personal information. What's your first name? You don't have to answer it. You can just submit, and that's fine. In which city are you right now? You don't have to <coughs> fill it in. It's optional. You can leave it blank. And, and there's no benefit if you fill it in. You won't get more money if you fill in your details. Guess how much people filled in? Well, we are actually quite surprised. Um, almost 80% revealed their first name. More than two-thirds revealed parts of their date of birth. And this is just the lower end. When we come to things which look more innocent, like what's your favorite color? 90%. Everything was optional. People knew it was optional. Why is this happening? We're here tapping into the social exchange relationship. It's no longer money for data. It's like, we're the good guys. Please give us your data. And people like this. And it's very powerful. And I don't say it's good. I just need to make, like, I want to say, let's think about this a little bit more carefully. I just want to conclude with two highlights on, on this. When we then made one of these fields, which people actually reveal all the time, mandatory, now you have to tell me what's your favorite color. Otherwise, no, you won't accept your form. Then suddenly, the, 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 the volunteering effect for the remaining optional fields dropped. So this broke the social exchange and was quite detrimental for the provider in this case. And then another question was, are you a good person? I know, you can answer that for yourself, but I tell you, those who said yes to this question revealed, on average, more than four times as many fields as those who said no. Well, that, <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sirin, for this uh, enlightening presentation. And I would like to give the floor now to our uh, discussant of this panel, uh, Professor Serge Gutwirth who is a professor of human rights, legal theory, comparative law and legal research at the Faculty of Law and Criminology of the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. Okay, thank you for that uh, very difficult task. Um, uh, I have the impression, I have the impression that uh, the debate about propertization or non-propertization of uh, personal data is mainly a debate about uh, an approach of the issue, a basic approach of the issue. And I think that on the one hand, the defenders of the idea of propertization of personal data are willing to see the market rules as a kind of constitution and that the opponents are trying to uh, think uh, personal data protection as a, a constitutional human rights related uh, value, a value in a democratic constitutional state. And 
Of course, both point of views are, are, are difficult to, to reconciliate, uh, as we see, for example, uh, in the European Union, where we have actually two constitutions, an economic constitution and a political constitution, and both are uh, always uh, conflicting. So I, I'm going to try to explain that in a, in a few uh, words, uh, starting from a, a, a short reflection about uh, what information is in, in, in our society, information as a good or as a value. And if you see, uh, if you look at information uh, from a legal point, but actually it has been corroborated by, by uh, economic uh, studies as well, for example, uh, Ian Mackay has uh, developed ideas in, uh, in that sense. Uh, it appears that information in our societies has very uh, peculiar, peculiar features uh, compared to material goods. And uh, one of the, I'm going to sum up a number of them. Uh, first of all, it is uh, ubiquitous any material. And that means that you can transfer information to another person without any loss. You keep it when you transfer it and then it's transferred again, and then the next one will have it, but no one will lose it. It is also possible to use it simultaneously. Right? Several people can use the same bit of information at the same moment in a different place, which is indeed not possible with a car, for example. It doesn't wear off. As such, information doesn't wear off. It can get older, it can, be, it can get it, lose pertinence, but it doesn't wear off with its use. It's not destroyable. If you see that I have blue eyes, and I want you not to know that, well, I am obliged to kill you. <laughs> it has, I can, you, cannot, you, cannot even, you cannot even restitute that knowledge to me. You cannot even say, oh, I will forget. Between brackets, that's something strange of the right to forget. You cannot impose to forget. Someone will not, some, you forget or you don't forget. And there's, no, there's no midway, but I know that's about, some, about something else. The name is not well chosen, but anyway. So you cannot, you cannot forget the information you know about me. So is it possible to steal information? Yeah, you can steal the carrier of information, but the information itself, when you copy it, you do not take it away. So information has a number of peculiar features, and that, in law, is very visible. Because when you look at the law, or the legal systems in general, you can see very well that all legal uh, provisions concerning information are special rules. Is information, in general, protected by property? No, certainly not. Which kind of informations are protected legally? Well, take a patent. A patent is a set, a bundle of exclusive rights you obtain as an inventor about the use of information. Is it a proprietary right? I would say no. And there is a debate between, I know, Anglo-Saxon lawyers and European continental lawyers about the nature of IPL, eh, intellectual property law, and at our side of the, of the ocean, we generally use the term intellectuelle rechten, droit intellectuel, intellectual rights, not property rights. And in fact, when you look at it, and take, uh, take uh, copyright as another example, if you write a, a book, you will get the copyright upon the form of your writing, not upon the content, and that is not a property right, because the copyright will give you the use in an exclusive way to commercially exploit, etc. Orla has uh, <coughs> mentioned the moral rights as well, and she's right, and, but that will be corroborated by what I'm going to tell you in a few minutes about human rights. Okay, so every protection, every protection of an informational good in our legal systems is always conceived as an exception on the free availability. And the basic rule concerning information 
is the free availability, the free access to information. If we limit in our legal systems the free availability of information, it is because there is a peculiar, particular reason to do that, which is inventions, which is uh, recognizing uh, copyright, which is protecting people against uh, malicious actions of others, uh, liability, and so on. There is the trade secrets, there are uh, professional secrets, and so on. But the basic line, the basic line concerning information is free flow. So I think that data protection is an extension of an extension of that uh, picture. Namely, the legislators find that personal data are a peculiar sort of information that should be protected in a certain sense. And so they have devised particular rules concerning the use, concerning the use of personal data. And that means, that means not necessarily that they have recognized a property right into information. And I think that it actually proves the contrary. I think that it actually proves the contrary because in our societies, free flow of information, freedom of expression, transparency, and so on, are also crucial values. So when we speak about information, we speak about a balance between access to and exclusive rights. And these exclusive rights are of a particular nature, well, intellectual rights, as I told you already. So that brings me back to the first statement I, I made. I think that uh, the plea for propertization of uh, personal data is actually a plea, uh, a plea that uh, disregards the public value of information, including personal data. And that is, with regards to transparency, that is essential to a democratic constitutional state, a problematic, a problematic insight. There is no reason to consider the fact that I see that you have blue eyes as an infringement of your property right. What kind of society are we going to step into if we start from that perspective? So we can turn the default position upside down and say everything circulates except, except <coughs> personal data under these and these and these and these and these conditions. And that is precisely what data protection does. All right, thank you, Serge. Um, I would like to ask our uh, panelists whether they have any comments to Serge's comments on, on uh, the, the other presentations. And I uh, would like to start with, uh, with Serge. Ah, um, well, thanks, Matthias. Thanks very much, Matthias. Um, uh, uh, the first thing I would, say, I would like to say is, although I'm, I'm not the, a legal scholar, I, I agree with, with much of what has been said from from the legal perspective. And I don't think that um, turning personal information into a property is helpful. I don't think we need it to achieve better privacy online. And I don't think that we need the concept of property to empower users in make the privacy choices they want to make. The mere fact that a company can possess information and maybe call it property is not, does not mean that the company can use this information at will. And I think if we call something property, then it may sometimes be implied that we can use it as will, at will. Uh, the advertising people call this permission-based marketing, and I think the way information is used is much more important than um, who holds which data. Because then, when we talk about how information is used, we can also talk about restrictions. Another point I would like to make is that with the with the propertization, it's um, 
it's not always helpful because we come back to the we come back to hierarchical relationships we come back to the fact that i give you my information very explicitly but sometimes the information exchange that we want to happen are not of this kind and are not market based think of the privacy movement if, as a movement, if you like. We're all part of it, sort of. A group of people concerned who f feel that uh, certain uh, sensitivities should be sharpened to the things that happen to personal data. One of the original insights of this movement, if it is a movement, <clears throat> which has led to privacy codes and to our being here, among many other things, is the notion that information on people, on the various aspects of their intimate lives is not ethically, nor should it be politically and economically, just the same as any other kind of information. So we've heard from Serge the argument about the publicity of eye color. And that argument, of course, is a Trojan horse for a much more general argument, I think, that all kinds of personal information should be like information about our eye color without distinction. I urge you to think carefully about that notion. There are very, very powerful forces at work transforming the social and economic significance of uh, commerce and personal information uh, in ways that almost nobody is prepared to endorse if you think about them. <clears throat> I'm reading from a story from Reuters early last month, reprinted in the New York Times. <clears throat> Uh, the consumer credit rating company Equifax, a big acknowledged merchandiser of people's credit standing, has agreed to pay $393,000 chicken feed to a company like that to settle allegations that it improperly sold information to consumers who had fallen behind in their mortgages, the Federal Trade Commission said on Wednesday. This is out of Washington. Equifax Information Services improperly sold 17,000 lists uh, to, of consumer information to direct lending source, which turned around and sold them to companies under investigation for allegedly duping customers with mortgage rescue scams. Let me explain what was happening here. Equifax, by virtue of its access to people's uh, credit records, which they can't avoid accumulating under American law, identified uh, families and individuals who were in danger of losing their houses uh, because of uh, falling behind, <clears throat> falling behind with mortgage payments in the peculiar conditions of these last four years. Uh, so it, it sold this information to a company called Direct Lending Source, uh, who in turn sold it to uh, other companies, according to this story, who used that information to scam. Uh, the people involved who were already in great distress, selling them ineffective measures to stop them, themselves from getting uh, repossessed of their homes. A direct lending source agreed to pay $1.2 million in civil penalties. Uh, Equifax ended its business relationship with direct lending source and its affiliates in the summer of 2011, said the Equifax spokesman, and he says, we reached an agreement with the FTC regarding issues uh, they brought to our attention regarding direct lending, which was a former customer of Equifax. Direct lending source could not be located for a comment. It did not appear to have a website and a telephone number listed as belonging to the company had been disconnected. So this kind of story is the, uh, a perfect example of how commercialization on a large industrial scale of personal information damages ordinary people in ways that they never deserve to be damaged and in which they, uh, against which they should most certainly be protected. And it is one of the ways in which uh, property rights and personal information, if enacted intelligently, could provide a very significant bulwark against such misuse. You want to mute your I, I your but my question would be, what, what would propertization do in such a case that is not done by data protection, except, except turning, turning the, 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 the register of the song in another, in another way? Well, I should reply directly to this. 
the virtue of having property rights and personal information is that it would uh, create a kind of social energy, it would create uh, counter-institutions, as I've argued in detail, uh, that would have it in their interest to troll the, and monitor the use of personal data and to uh, advocate and fight on behalf, partly for economic reasons for ordinary individuals, against uh, these rogue uses of their data. Uh, the FTC in the United States has taken an active interest uh, in the last several years that it never took before. That interest could disappear in a flash, for example, if uh, the presidency should change or if the political winds in Congress should change. What's more, and this is very important, it's important to this whole discussion of, uh, of uh, tools for the uh, protection of individual rights, no regulatory agency can possibly track and monitor the full array of complex and sub rosa activities, commercial activities and personal information that bear on the interests of ordinary citizens. It's just too much. Ordinary citizens don't know that these laws exist. Uh, regulatory agencies, even if they're most energetic, can't keep track of, of the fine detail of transactions like the one that I've just described. This is the tip of the iceberg where these folks got caught. So if there were counter institutions, organizations, as I've argued, like ASCAP and BMI, who would monitor the personal data for, uh, for financial reasons of their own, uh, would monitor the flow and use of personal data, ordinary people would have much more uh, resource, much more muscle behind their position than they do today. Uh, Ola and Nadja, do you want to give some comments before we're opening it up to the floor? Um, well, I, I suppose on that point, I, I, I think in, in the EU you still have to come back to the question of what would properization in that type of situation add that we don't already have. We have these rights on the books. The question is, you know, if I were to say to people here, can you name five rights which you're granted by EU data protection legislation, could most people name two? I probably can't name five and I've just written a PhD on it. So I think, you know, the question is how do you, I, I absolutely agree you need to get people concerned in this and that a regulatory agency can't track it all. But the question is in the EU, do we need to make this shift from propertization or from what we have to propertization in order to do that? And I think it just comes down to kind of reworking what we have and getting people excited, if people are ever going to get excited about this, about what we have. Um, I do think the debate about propertization, I agree to a certain extent, it is a, a debate about whether you introduce market mechanisms, but I don't see the market mechanisms as completely against fundamental rights. So I don't think somebody who propagates the anti, or the propertization view is against fundamental rights. This is a question about what's the best mechanism to ensure the protection of these fundamental rights. So what Nadia was saying was, well, and you'll correct me on this, I'm sure, but it's about how to best ensure informational self-determination. Um, so still about the protection of rights, but a question of, of the mechanism that's, that's used to do it. I, I think we had a similar incident in the UK about seven or eight years ago where the UK's um, driving license authority uh, sold data to crooks who then, um, who then subsequently proceeded to contact people um, informing them that they'd broken speeding rules and to pay directly to bank account X <laughs> and it was a, quite a successful scheme. So, but I think there that the, the proper regulatory response is a heavy sanction, first of all to the driving licence authority for um, giving away this data in the first instance, or commercialising this data without consent in the first instance, and then obviously criminal sanctions for whoever uses it for inappropriate, um, inappropriate means. That's it. Um, I just wanted to respond to the Serge, uh, comment that Serge made, that it doesn't make sense to make a property out of information. Um, I think to speak of no ownership of personal data at the current stage of information, uh, personal data markets is an illusion. Yes, it is true that uh, the fact that somebody knows that I have a certain color of the eyes does not uh, make my eyes less green, <coughs> but um, the fact that information industries enjoy uh, the fruit of the knowledge that I have certain consumer preferences limits, sorry, limits my uh, enjoyment of my personal data 
as a means to connect to other people, to keep some data to myself or disclose it to a um, broader or narrower range of individuals. Uh, empirical research into uh, property um, not assigned officially by the state, for instance, in land during gold, uh, gold rush period shows that when there is no property regime, but, but, but there is a market for something and some resource has a value, property rights emerge by themselves and the scope of them is established by the players in the field proportionate and they grab as much as they get, uh, as much as they can, proportionate to the resources available for them to exercise violence in the broadest sense of the word. And I think this is what happens. Information industry already claimed its ownership in our personal data. And I think to speak of no ownership in personal data would be doing injustice to data, data subjects. That's Okay, enough uh, for the panel for now. Are there uh, any questions from uh, the audience to our panelists? Uh, yes, Claudia? Thank you. So, Claudia Diaz from K11. Yeah, so I have the impression that when this debate of propertization of personal data comes up, it only refers to a very small subset of data, which means uh, what is so, sort of name, mobile phone address, date of birth, and so on. But I would think that a lot of the money that is being made with data online is really more behavioral data that is very easily anonymized. And the practice of anonymizing it is already done to sort of escape obligations of data protection. So wouldn't that be used as well to not pay property rights to people just to do some token anonymization or aggregation so that is no personal data anymore. Can I respond? There was a decision of the Dutch Data Protection Authority, I think two months ago, on the matter of TomTom, where TomTom, uh, it's a navigation company, company that provides the, you know, hardware and software for the drivers, uh, collected the data of traffic data of the drivers without informing them that it will be subsequently sold anonymized to the police authorities for them to identify the spots where they would in install the, uh, uh, the cameras uh, and the data protection authority basically explained that uh, anonymization did not relieve the TomTom -tom of the obligation to notify for which purposes the data will be used. The, so anonymization is not a buffer. And these property claims would actually hold for uh, like the widest range of, person, of kinds of personal data, not necessarily uh, name, address, etc., but also behavioral data. Yes, sir. I think that here it is important to make the difference between data protection and privacy. And uh, data protection applies when personal data are processed. And a personal data actually can be a data that has no privacy impact. Your name, your eyes, color, and it's open to discussion. This, these are not really privacy sensitive data. But you can violate someone's privacy, someone's privacy by processing an anonymous data. Huh? Why? Because you change the environment as a reaction about, as a reaction upon the way a person behaves without identifying him. And then you interfere with his behavior, and that is a problem from the point of view of privacy and not of data protection. And both, both overlap a bit or much, but there is a, a zone which is purely data protection and there is a zone which is purely privacy. And so and the, 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 the processing of anonymous data can fall outside the scope of data protection, but could spawn a problem of privacy. And I think that is an aspect which is important in that discussion. Okay, there was a, another question at the back from uh, Maria. I'd like to address two questions. Um, the first one is to Sergio. 
Uh, in regards to data protection laws, you mentioned that they uh, basically uh, protect privacy. Uh, my question is that since data protection laws across the world have proven to be inadequate, since there have been numerous privacy breaches, um, what would you propose? How do you think privacy could really be um, protected in practice? And my second question, which is towards uh, Nadia, uh, before you mentioned that, um, in your opinion, individual ownership of personal data is, is informational self-determination. Um, my question is, how can self-determination actually um, prevent, uh, prevent governments and intelligent agencies from using surveillance devices to process and statistically analyze our data? How can self-determination prevent data mining? Um, is this ownership, actual ownership of data, or is it just an illusion? Whoever wants to go first. I think one was for you and one was for me. Oh, I, I didn't hear one, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I can answer the question on the informational self-determination. Uh, as the system of, of uh, human rights stands in Europe, uh, under the European Convention of Human Rights, almost no right is absolute. And the, the right to privacy and data protection is not an exception. So um, informational self-determination can also be, uh, it again depends on how you define it. Let's say there is a lot of literature defending informational self-determination as a normative ground of data protection However, there is uh, German constitutional court came up with a definition that is binding for this jurisdiction of what informational self-determination is. On the level of Europe, there is no such a binding definition. And it is unclear to me whether the informational self-determination is the core of the right to data protection that cannot be uh, restricted anyhow, or it is it covers the entire span of data protection rights, but um, as to the government intervention into the personal life by surveillance cameras, etc., it is all a matter of pro how proportionate the intervention is to what means, and it depends. Uh, for instance, as, as far as I know, uh, uh, maybe five years ago, the surveillance cameras were of such poor quality that. Uh, let's say they did not simply deliver on what they uh, what they were supposed to deliver. For instance, crimes filmed. Uh, let's say the quality of the film was so bad that you could not identify, for, for instance, who committed the crime. And now, uh, let's say, so the question would arise: if the surveillance doesn't achieve the goal, why do we have the cameras? However, now the technology achieved uh, sufficiently. Uh, high level of quality to actually fulfill the functions as it's a matter of normative choice, whether it is a proportionate intervention or not. I don't know if I answered your question sufficiently. Yeah, more like so just on that, that point of um, state surveillance and, and the role that data protection can play, I think it's really important um, when we talk about, you know, the, the right to data protection was introduced in EU law and became binding since on, on member states since 2009, um, if, when the EU Charter got binding force. Um, but that right is very much, c compared to other rights, the convention rights which are all applicable to states, the right to data protection is actually, I think, angled more at private parties than it is the state. Even, you have, first of all, the separate regime which is in place at the moment, the directive, and then separate rules for processing for police and judicial cooperation and criminal purposes. That distinction is going to carry on even with the, new, the newly negotiated package. Um, and I've even heard talk that there will be two separate uh, instruments, one applicable to the state and one applicable to private parties. But even if you look at the rules now, which are supposedly applicable to the state and to uh, private enterprises and, and parties, um, for purposes that aren't police and judicial cooperation or criminal, the carve-outs for the state are exceptionally broad. So I think it's a bit of a legal fiction to talk about a data protection right that's um, applicable against the state. Um, I, I just think if you look into the details of this, it, it, to call it a, a, a right against the state is just erroneous, basically. Okay, we have uh, five more minutes. Are there any more questions? Yes, the gentleman here. Um, 
think about uh, open data was also a European uh, project and data protection and also the ownership of the data. Does anybody want to answer that one? Um, I think open data is, is as much of a buzz, buzzword as, as big data, and, and open data is often big data as well. Um, so I hope I, I, I catch the right angle of, of open data now. Um, I think open data means that, that there is a community sourced collection of facts about certain real world phenomena. Is that, is that what you mean? Good, thanks. Um, then, um, then I think we, we see instances of open data which have been quite successful. See, take OpenStreetMap, and here we have a case of licensing. So people have contributed data to this project and have licensed it, and there was a change in license recently. And then some data was actually pulled out of the project because it was incompatible with the license under which people have contributed to the project. In other instances, it's, it's where people contribute data about themselves. I think um, here it's, it's a very interesting instance of where people think that they contribute something for the, for the, for the higher good of, of being good for the society and contributing to a larger effort. In this case, actually, people um, contribute quite vividly and like to volunteer information. I think that's quite powerful. Yeah. I think one thing we probably could all agree on is we do not want to live in a world where there is no public sphere. We do not want to live in a world where people who make public pronouncements, for example, are free from the danger of criticism and comment about the, uh, their own lives or on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, their, uh, the accordance of their actions with the principles that they profess. Uh, so it's very important for all kinds of key democratic values uh, that once information uh, is, uh, is deemed legally public information, uh, the, the realm of public discourse has to be protected. Is that the same as saying that uh, parties have a right to buy and sell, uh, should have the right to buy and sell personal information for commercial or profit-making purposes? Uh, maybe, maybe yes, in the case of a certain kind of journalism, which is called in the United States cash for trash journalism, in other words, where, where uh, someone is paid to make an embarrassing revelation, usually not by a very reputable newspaper, and that gets into the press. Should people's disclosure of their personal financial situations uh, as it's made under duress to credit agencies then be subject to sale to other interested parties in any form? I would say no. And if we can't draw an intelligent line between information that belongs in the realm of public discourse, like our eye color, and quite private personal information, like whether we're in danger of foreclosure on our mortgages, we're in very big trouble. Okay, so we're almost running out of time, and I see that uh, Serge wants to say something more. Uh, yeah, you can to, have the, the last yeah, I wanted word. to reply to that and, and to, to, to uh, ask why ownership is a solution to this, to this issue. I, with, with copyright, it is clear that a copyright holder is not the owner of this information. After a number of years, uh, it falls, uh, the, the, the work falls in the public domain. The same applies to patents. So they, these are not owners, mm -hmm. but they are protected. They are protected in the way that you say. Uh, you cannot do what you want with that information in the public sphere, although it is public. So why, speak, why do we have to speak in terms of property and ownership and not in, property of, in, in uh, terms of uh, what we call exclusive rights like IPL or or even uh, liability rules and, 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 and administrative rules, so like, like in, uh, in, in, in uh, data protection. So I think the, 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 the stakes are really stakes of, of, of fundamental discourse about, about uh, uh, personal information. 
And what I think is important is to remind that all our fundamental rights are both individual rights, but are also characterizing the sort of society in which we live, and that they are part of the public order. So they have a public value as well. Okay, I promised Serge would have the last word, but I can't say no to a final question of our co-organizer, uh, Seda. So please. <laughs> intellectual property rights have been technically implemented. And it has been a lot of DRMs, if they're successful or not is another question. It has been a lot of surveillance, right? So I'm just wondering if we would put a similar sort of twist on personal data, which is try to make it scarce, try to make it a market commodity, if the technical implementation would not mean more surveillance, and if you think this is a reasonable approach. Thanks. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if I understood your question correctly, you asked if a, impl a technical implementation of property rights would lead effectively to more surveillance. So you mean, serve, uh, let's say, the monsieur becomes the monsieur. So the one who was, let's say, watching you now is watched by you. But isn't this the, let's say, one of the principles of data protection, transparency and accountability? Of course you watch who has, uh, who has your personal data on the one side. And on the second side, there is a twist in that. Um, according to the empirical findings of uh, Professor Akisti, um, there is such a so-called so uh, control paradox. When people believe they are in control of their personal information, they tend to disclose more. So I think it's a very interesting um, aspect, but then if, if the controls are real and not only the illusion, I don't see the problem in that. Can I give a, a different kind of answer to the same question? Somebody, some agency, some party has to be keeping track of this enormously complex commerce in personal information, which is a reality. Uh, there are already people who are paid to do it in the interests of their companies and organizations. There needs to be some kind of new company or uh, concern uh, whose job it is to monitor these flows on behalf of individuals. It's not a question of whether more or less information will be out there. It's a question of on whose behalf the transactions in those, uh, in those data will be, uh, will be tracked or monitored. Uh, and the only realistic way I can see, given the limitations of uh, administration in this respect, the, the administrations of, uh, the limitations of regulation, uh, is to uh, uh, envisage the growth of some kind of industry that acts as a sort of a guardian of, of copyright, individuals' copyrights in their own commercial lives, much as ASCAP or BMI do the performance of music, for example. And with, this, with these words, we're uh, about to end our debate, and I'm sure we can uh, continue during, uh, during the coffee break. So please enjoy all coffee. Thanks to all the participants of my panel and the audience for the questions. Thanks. Thank